a couple of rare types that are almost never found. There so, are many rares, yes. For all practical purposes, the field is limited to an A, a B, or a C. Correct. Now, if someone inherited the B characteristic from both parents, then they would appear as a B. That's correct. And if someone inherited the A characteristic from both parents, they would be an A. That's true. And if someone inherited an A from mom and a B from dad, they'd be a BA. That's correct. And that's basically how it works. And the same thing would apply if you got a C from one of your parents. Yes. Now, the way you determine what an EAP type is, is by looking at the bands on the gel to see where they stopped when you turned the current off, correct? That's one of the factors in this, yes. And you've seen, uh, you've seen these slides before. We looked at these yesterday. You call that? Yes, I do. And the slide that's up there now is, a, is your electrophoretogram for run number 7310, correct? Yes, it is. And does that appear to be uh, an accurate picture of that slide? Yes. Now, I might indicate that we talked about this yesterday. Sometimes these slides, when you scan them in the computer, don't pick up all of the nuances of the, of the banding patterns, correct? Oh, that's correct, yes. Yeah, some things may not show up as well being projected like this and looking at the original photograph. And we have the original photographs, so we can look at those at some point, correct? Yes, I have them here. Now, can we go to the next slide, please? Now, I've uh, drawn a box around a band, or I'm sorry, a lane in the middle of this electrophoretogram, correct? Yes. And this is what's called a standard. In other words, you knew what this was before you tested it, correct? That's correct. And you knew this was a BA. That's true. And the reason you do this is so that you can look at your unknown evidence that you're testing and, well, let me rephrase that. The reason you do this is because you want to see if the test worked okay. If, if this comes back the way you expected it to, that's a good indication the test worked. That's one of the reasons, yes. Now, this particular lane in the middle, this BA standard, came back the way it's supposed to, didn't it? That's a typical looking BA, yes. And let's go to the next slide. This slide C. C. Now, I've drawn boxes around the various bands in that standard, and there are four bands, correct? Yes, there are. Go to the next slide, please. Now, I've removed the picture from the background so it's a little bit easier to see. Those four bands are called B1, A1, B2, and A2, aren't they? That's one of the designations for me, yes. We do the next slide, please. Now, I've colored them in so that they're a little bit easier to distinguish. Now, if someone is an A, they're going to have two bands located at A1 and A2, correct? Yes. That's what you would expect to see. That's correct. If somebody is a B, you would expect to see two bands, one at B1, one at B2, correct? Yes. Go to the next slide, please. Now, you, would you agree that if you saw that particular banding pattern depicted on slide F, that's a BA? It's a rough graphical demonstration of it. It has a little bit of a problem in that it doesn't indicate the intensity differences in the bands. OK, well, let me ask you about that. The, you talked about how the intensity of a band might affect the reading, correct? It definitely does affect the reading, yes. Now, C bands, which are not on this diagram, correspond in position to the B bands, don't they? Yes, they do. So that you can have a C with a banding pattern that, that is at the same space as on the electrophoretogram as the, as the B, correct? That's correct. The two C bands run the same distances of the B bands. And one of the ways that you tell the difference between a C and a B is by the differences in intensities of, the various, of those two bands, correct? Well, not one of the ways, the way the is way. to tell the difference, look at the difference in the intensities or brightnesses of the bands. All right. Now, if you're talking about comparing an A and a B, however, none of those bands overlap, do they? No, they do not. So if your universe is limited to an A or a B, band intensity is irrelevant, correct? No, that's not true. 
what is the effect of band intensity on telling the difference between an A and a B? Well, as far as telling the difference between the two, I'm sorry if I misunderstood your last question, uh, it doesn't make a difference. It does make a difference when evaluating the sample and whether or not you call it, because okay. you expect to see intensities in certain ways uh, as far as the result goes. Okay. But as far as distinguishing an A from a B, it's irrelevant. The intensities, that's correct. Now, if we have the next slide, please. Now, this is the pattern you would expect to see with a type B, correct? Again, except for the fact that the B2 is the more intense and would be larger, and the B1 is less intense. Okay, but in, in terms of relative position, that's correct, isn't it? That's true. And next slide, please. Well, and this, this one is which? Th that was G. G. This is H. All right, you need to, for the purpose of the record, let me know which okay. one you're bringing up. And correspondingly, the column on the right, that's what an A would look like in terms of the position of the bands. Yes, that's true. Next slide, please. This is I. Now, Mr. Matheson, this is a picture of the electrophoretogram that contains the fingernails, is it not? Yes, it is. Now, this has a lot of little dots and things on it that uh, are extraneous results that, that sometimes come up in these tests, correct? That's correct. The dots, the round dots that you see uh, are not related to the EAP or the information from the samples. And the scientific term for that is schmutz, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, I don't think I've heard that term, but... Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mr. Schechtel. Uh, next slide, please. This is Jay. Now, I've circled or boxed three lanes of that electrophoretogram, correct? Yes, you have. And the, the lane on the right of the box is your BA standard lane, correct? That's correct. And the two lanes next to it, to the left, are 84A and 84B, correct? Yes. Next slide, please. Now, I'm going to isolate just those three bands, correct? Yes. And that's slide K. And let's go to L. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so we can look at it a little more carefully. Now let's go to M. Now, I've drawn boxes around the bands in their approximate positions, correct? The approximate position, yes. Now, let me, let me back up a little bit. The, when we saw the picture of the electrophoretogram, it looked like it was a little bit bowed down at the sides, correct? Oh, well, it was quite a bit bowed quite at one point, bit. yes. And that happens sometimes uh, as a function of the way the test is done, correct? Yes. It doesn't invalidate the test, does it? No. Because you can, you can adjust the bow to figure out where the bands are um, and essentially straighten it out, in essence, to figure out which bands you're looking at, can't you? You can sometimes, yes. Now, the bands that I've boxed there are slightly out of line with the standard because the electrophoretogram was bowed a little bit, correct? Yes. And would you agree that the boxes that I've put around the bands are this, the bands that you read when you did this test? What's vague as to the bands that you read? Overall. Do you understand the question, sir? Yes. All right. In yeah. the, I'm sorry? In the case of 84A and 84B, uh, those are uh, two bands that are visible. Uh, that is not the only parts of that area that are taken into account. But those are the bands that are there? That's correct. And next slide, please. Now we're taking the background out to give a, so you can see it a little bit better. That's N. Now let's do M. I'm going to object at this point on the grounds previously stated no, that I thought were going to be clarified. You were going to ask a question regarding the alignment of the boxes. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I did. Uh, Mr. Matheson on this is slide. Oh. I've indicated that the bands from the fingernails are bands B1 and B2, and that's the bands that we saw on the electrophoretogram, correct? All right. For those items under the 84A and 84B, that's correct. They're roughly where they are. Don't take into account the curve, and they don't take into account the intensity differences. Right. And if we adjusted the curve, those bands under 84A and 84B would line up with the standard B bands in the standard BA, correct? That's correct. Next slide, please. Now, and as you read in your report, 
the fingernail, I'm sorry, as you, as you reported in your report, your reading of that test was that the, both fingernails from both hands were type B, correct? That's correct. And that was slide T. P. P. Let's go to Q. Now we're back to our standard BA in Q. Let's go to R. Let's go to S. Part of your testimony the other day concerned the manner in which a BA can degrade, correct? That's correct. Now, if you have a BA, you would have the, pan the banding pattern that we have up on slide S, correct? Again, not taking into account the intensity differences, but that's the locations of the bands. Now, I want you to assume, for purposes of hypothetical, that the degradation that occurs when a BA degrades involves bands disappearing from the top down. Improper hypothetical, no foundation for it. Sustain. We're afraid it's a question. Mr. Matheson, let me ask you about some of the scientific literature. You referred to an article by Grunbaum and Zajac in your direct testimony. You recall that? I was directed to that, yes. There is other literature on the EAP systems, correct? Yes. And you're familiar with that other literature, are you not? I've read some of them, yes. And you were provided a copy with a number of different articles the other day, were you not? No, I was not. Oh. Are you familiar with an article by Dr. George Sensabaugh entitled The Utilization of Polymorphic Enzymes in Forensic Science? I'd like to see it, please. Sure. I've seen this, yes. And you relied upon that and the way you evaluate the EAP system. It's over broad questions phrased. Overall. I have read this article, and there is information in it that, uh, regarding the EAP uh, in general, is one of many references that, that I have referenced in relation to the EAP system. So it's, it's one that you have considered and referred to? I have considered some of the information. Vegas considered in what? In rendering opinion? We'll get there in a second. Did you do any research at all before your testimony on the, the rate at which, according to the scientific literature, a BA degrades to a B? I have done some reading, reading on that, yes. What things did you read? Well, there was uh, three or four articles that uh, I read that related to uh, degradation of EAP in general and many of them that reference one particular way that it uh, degrades. What articles did you read? I could, uh, I think I reference to give you a, a couple of them. Yes. As mentioned earlier, one of the ones that I've read is this article that you presented before me. I also read an article entitled Erythrocyte Acid Phosphatase in Blood Stains by Raxel and Eames. Yes, it is. And I also referenced a, a book called the 
uh, source book. Source book in forensic serology, immunology, and biochemistry. And I also read portions from a book called Forensic Science Handbook by Richard Safferstein. Are you familiar with a technical note by a T.E. Yeshion, Y-E-S-H-I-O-N, titled Thermal Degradation of Erythrocyte Acid Phosphatase Isoenzymes in a Case Sample? I read that one the other day, yes. that article. Yes, it appears to be. And have you reviewed and considered an article by R.A. Fisher and Harry Harris titled, Studies on the Separate Isoenzymes of Red Cell Acid Phosphatase Phenotypes A and B? And I'd like to see it, please. This one does not look familiar to me. Other than the Grunbaum article, incidentally, let me show you a copy of that and ask if this is the article that you testified about the other day. Yes, it appears to be. Other than the Raxall article, the Yeshian article, the Grunbaum article, and the Sensabaugh article, are there any other scientific articles that you have reviewed specifically to look for how a BA degrades? It's vagus to time. Overall. In preparation for this case. I believe I mentioned two other references, uh, something that is a commonly called source book and another a textbook by uh, Safferstein. And I was talking about articles devoted to that topic specifically rather than textbooks. Oh, I'm sorry. I, to best my recollection, that's it. Okay. What do those articles say about the rate at which a BA degrades? Rate meaning the amount of time it takes? Or? No. Which bands disappear first? Most of the articles uh, make reference to the fact that degradation does in fact occur and that as a rule it tends to go from the anodal or the faster bands down towards the cathodal or slower bands. Would you agree that those articles stand for the proposition that at the first stage of degradation you lose the A2 band? It's overbroad as to those articles sustained. The, the articles we've been talking about. It's still overbroad. Stay. Sansibah, Zajac, <coughs> Yeshian, and Raxall. Those four articles. Would you agree that the results of their scientific tests are that the first thing to disappear is the A2? Assumes that they all did scientific tests. That kind of numbers. Or will. They do tend to point out or point out that the most labile or the first one to go is, in fact, that uh, fastest Next A2 slide. bin. I'm sorry. Next slide. This is key. So after that first stage of degradation, your BA is going to look like the right-hand column of slide T, according to the scientific literature, correct? This scientific literature. According to those articles, that's the uh, degradation route that they have seen. 
Now those articles also state, do they not, that the next stage of degradation is you lose the B2 band. Well, it assumes that there's only one degradation route. In fact, I'm like this. Oh, we'll talk, this is in, in reference to these articles. Yes. That's the general route that those articles reference, yes. Okay, the next slide, please. This is what? You? You. So would you agree, would you not, that these articles indicate that the next stage of degradation you would see, if you had a BA that was degrading, you would see two bands, the B1 and the A1 band. Under the conditions that those studies were run in, uh, yes, that is the general route of degradation. Now, those studies further indicate, do they not, that the next thing to go when it degrades is the A1 band, correct? That's the general route of that form of degradation, yes. Next slide, please. So therefore, according to these articles, a BA that's degrading will ultimately, before the last band disappears, have the B1 band there, correct? Again, according to the conditions that those samples are treated and under the conditions they are run, that is the degradation route that's referred to. I agree that under that degradation route, you never have the pattern of a BA that's degraded that has both the B1 and the B2 bands without the A1 band. Again, given the uh, things I mentioned before, the condition of the samples in those studies and the system they used for identifying it, that is true. And in this case, your test results showed both the B1 <coughs> and the B2 band without the A1 band, didn't they? That's correct. So under this scientific literature, if this BA was a degraded, I'm sorry, if your B under the fingernails was a degraded BA, it wouldn't look like the results you got, would it? If my sample or the samples that I analyzed were under those conditions in those studies and run in the same way, that's correct. Can you cite me to a single scientific article that states that the degradation route taken by a BA when it degrades would ever get you to the point where you're going to have a B1 and a B2 without the A1. And we're talking specifically about articles at this point. Yes. No, I cannot. I think you said also, let me turn that off now. That we've, that we've talked about, the reason cited in those articles for doing these studies is to find out how a BA degrades, correct? So that was one of the purposes of all these articles. Well, it's known that it does degrade, so yes, the purpose of those articles, uh, potentially among other things, because they include other bits of information, is to determine one of the ways that uh, B or a, uh, EAP will degrade. And all of those articles talk about you, you could misinterpret a BA or B, I'm sorry, you could misinterpret a BA for a B if you made a reading based on just that B1 band at the end, correct? That's correct. And they all say that, therefore, you shouldn't make any reading at all if all you have is one B1 band, correct? That's correct. But they say also that you will not have a mistyping where you have a B1 and a B2 band because that would not be a degraded BA, correct? I don't believe they all say that, no. Can you say, show me one that doesn't say that? It's going to take me a few minutes to look. I believe they uh, uh, say that that are things that may happen, but... Uh... <clears throat> well, count, Council, let's move on. We're not going to sit here and read articles. They do say that you can accurately read a BA and a B as long as there are two bands present. In other words, you can read a B if there are two bands present accurately, correct? It's incomplete as to what conditions sustain. Actually, when you say they, you need, I think you need In to the specify which articles. Do any of the articles say that you should not call a B where you have both the B1 and B2 bands? No, they don't. Do they all say that you shouldn't make any call at all if you only have one band? It's my understanding, yes. Now, one of the, you also testified that item 42 had the same appearance, or the, 
the same reading as the fingernails, correct? No, I don't believe I said they had the same reading or the same appearance. Can we go back to uh, slide A? the one we were talking about with a standard? Yes, I do. Would you agree that the lane next to the standard that we used, in fact, why don't you go to the next slide, slide B, that the lane just to the right of the standard lane is item, I'm sorry, it, actually it's, it's uh, to, the, to the left of the box is item 42. Yes, adjacent to the other standard. photograph of that same electrophoretogram. Yes, it does. It appears to be an enlargement of it. And item uh, 42 appears in that electrophoretogram as it does in the slide on the projector, correct? I was in the same location and the, it's much easier to read in this photograph. Now there is, you can pick up a little bit more in the photograph than you can on the slide, correct? I've checked to the phrase a little bit more. Who phrase it? You can see some very, very faint banding patterns under 42 that doesn't completely show up in the slide, correct? That's correct. Uh, maybe we could try to put this on the Elmo. To illustrate this. <coughs> I think that's one we may have to have both up and have the jury look at the uh, blow up. That's fine. Can we try this? In well, yeah, I'll try it, but i just trying to save some time here. In fact, let me. We can see a little bit better this way, would you agree? A little bit better. <laughs> and would you agree that the lane for item 42 appears to have three very faint bands corresponding to B1, A1, and B2? Very faint. Well, the B1 and B2, uh, I believe I can see what are banding areas, uh, very kind of fuzzy, difficult to read. There is kind of a brightish cloud in the A1 region. And the photograph is 1141 A1. Now the very faint can you, can you see the behind you on the screen up there? The very faint fuzzy A1 band is, is what I've got the light on, correct? Well, that, that mistakes the evidence. Well, or we'll right about there. Well, there is some fluorescence in that area. It's not even really what I would call a, a band. It's not, and that one of the reasons that this was an inconclusive is because those are not sufficiently uh, well-defined bands to really make a type on, correct? Those is overbroad. Oh, which, well. which of the, the faint markings you see in lane 42. 
It was called inconclusive, right, because the bands that I visualized in there just were not what I would call clear-cut bands. And let me show you a photograph of the fingernail slide that appeared to be a similar photograph. Yes, it does. And this would be 1141J1. that we have on the projector. Yes, I do. And the 42, again, is the one that I have the uh, laser light on now up on the big projector. Can you see that behind I'm you? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, the, the, the light that I'm using on the large projector up above you is the 42 lane, correct? Yes, it is. And the lanes over here, oh good, we've got the arrow. Can we move the arrow over to 84 A and B? Right there. Those are the banding patterns from the fingernails, correct? Yes, that's correct. And could we put an arrow over by 42 as well? Can you affix one there? Would you agree that the banding patterns for 84 A and B are much more distinctive than 42? Yes. And that's why you read 84 A and B and did not report anything other than inconclusive for 42. It's one of the reasons, yes. Print of items 42 and 84. What was the it was the two electrophoretograms of 42 and 84 side by side with arrows. Now, your testimony the other day about 42 was to the effect that since 42 was preserved under similar conditions to 84A and B, therefore you can draw some kind of an analogy between the results of 42 and the results of 84, correct? The state's testimony. Forward. I believe environmental conditions and the like was one of the things that we mentioned uh, that is used in the total consideration of everything. Now, one of the, the photographs that you looked at of Nicole Brown Simpson showed one of her hands under her body and one of her hands up exposed to the air, correct? Yes. So those two were not under the same conditions in terms of drying or being in a pool of blood, were they? Not exactly the same, no. And would you agree that if you follow the scientific literature that I've shown to you and that you've reviewed, that the blood under Nicole Brown Simpson's fingernails cannot be a BA? That's an improper hypothetical. Overall. I'm sorry, could you read that or repeat that, please? Would you agree that under the scientific literature that we've reviewed here, that the blood under Nicole Brown Simpson's fingernails cannot be a degraded BA? If you look strictly at the literature and if the conditions under the fingernails are the same as the way those studies were done in the literature and the technique used to identify it was the same as that I used in my testing, then it does not follow that degradation route. That's correct. And if that's true, then it has to have come from somebody else, correct? Improper hypothetical. Oh. Given all of the considerations that I mentioned, they would all have to be the same 
And if, like I said, in fact, it did follow that same degradation route, then it would have to be a B and it would have to come from somebody else. Now, if you have test results that you think might be wrong or ambiguous, what are you supposed to do as a scientist? I would not report them if they are wrong or ambiguous. If you thought that the results were wrong, would you redo the test? Depends on what other tests were available to me. Now, looking at EAP, well, if you do a PGM test or a DNA test, you're not looking at the same things as you're looking at an EAP, are you? You are potentially looking at the same thing, but there are other factors, that's correct. Nothing that you do other than an EAP test is going to give you an EAP reading, correct? Oh, that's correct, yes. I mean, only an EAP test is going to give you an EAP result. So the only way that you could double check that EAP test would be to do another EAP test, correct? Well, theoretically, if, if they knew what caused the EAP type at the DNA level, uh, you could do it that way. I don't believe there's a standard test for that right now. So the only way to reconfirm that result would be to run the exact same test again. These fingernail scrapings were sent back to you by the Department of Justice for the purposes of doing another EAP test, weren't they? At some point, you sent them to DOJ and they sent them back, didn't they? Yes, that's true. What was the purpose for them sending it back? Because it's our evidence. The evidence belongs back here when they're done completing it so that uh, it could become part of the rest of the case. Did you ever consider doing a retest of those fingernail scrapings, an EAP test, to see whether your original results were wrong? Did I consider it? Yes. I considered it, yes. You wanted to do it, didn't you? I felt that uh, there was other tests that could give more information. I did not want to consume any more of the sample just to repeat the exact same thing again. So you've done no retesting to demonstrate whether this EAP is anything other than a B or someone other than Mr. Simpson, correct? There has never been any other testing. I, excuse me, I have not repeated or done any other EAP testing. That's correct. No further questions. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our recess for the morning session. Please remember all of my admonitions to you. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves. Don't form any opinions about the case. Don't allow anybody to communicate with you. Do not conduct any deliberations till the matter has been submitted to you. We'll stand in recess till 1 o'clock. All right, Mr. Goldberg, you had some uh, comment or concern regarding uh, discovery matters? Yes, Your Honor. On the photographs uh, that counsel um, <coughs> used today of the blood vial, I do not believe that, that we were provided those in discovery. Uh, we have another set of defense photographs of the blood vial that we do have. Mr. Sheck tells me that he thinks that uh, it's possible that the photographs that they use could be people's photographs. And I did not have an opportunity over the noon hour to verify that, so at this time I can't be 100 percent sure that, he, that he's wrong. Uh, but this is a possible discovery violation. I'm just not in a position at this point to, to say it with certainty. Well, given Mr. Matheson's testimony that he recognized it and testified to what it was, unless there's some other materiality to it, I, 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 I'm, gonna, I'm not going to entertain any further comment on it then until you tell me it's relevant. All right. Let's have the jury.
please be seated. All right, Mr. Matheson, would you uh, resume the uh, witness stand, please? All right, the record should reflect we've been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Mr. Gregory Matheson is again on the witness stand now undergoing a redirect examination. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, Mr. Matheson. You're reminded you are still under oath, sir. Mr. Yes. Goldberg, you may uh, con commence your redirect examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mr. Matheson. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Sir, I wanted to start out by uh, asking you more about this EAP issue, and I know we've discussed it at some length. Uh, you were asked about some literature during cross-examination. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. And specifically, you were asked about four articles <coughs> that you were shown on the witness stand that you read prior to your testimony in court. That's correct. Uh, now, you said at one point that those were the only articles that you considered prior to testifying about this EAP issue for your testimony in this proceeding. That's correct. But you alluded to some book that you looked at? Yes, I did. Now, why on cross-examination didn't you tell the defense about what was in this book? I wasn't asked about it. I was limited to the articles. You mean by the questioning? Yes, that's correct. All right. I'd like to get into that uh, in a little <clears throat> while, but first let's take a look at some of these articles that were referred to. Mr. Matheson, first um, on the Raxel and Eames article. How do you spell that? W-R-A-X-A-L-L Eames, E-M-E-S. Thank you. Thank you. Is this one of the articles, sir, that you considered prior to your testimony? It's one of the ones I read, yes. And uh, did this article actually contain a study that was done involving a number of samples to determine how it degrades, how the EAP marker degrades? Yes, it did. Now, on these stains that were uh, studied in this particular article. Were these stains in a wet condition or in a dry laboratory condition? I believe they were dry. Now, the stains at the scene in this case, item 42, if we were to uh, assume hypothetically that when Mr. Uh, Fung saw that, he described it as being tacky when he arrived there at some time after 10.15. Would that distinguish the blood that we're talking about in our case from the type of blood that was studied in the Raxel article? Your Honor, objection. states the testimony if he's talking about the fingernails. I'm sorry? If he's talking about the fingernails. Oh, well. <clears throat> if the blood was tacky or damp, then that would be a different set of conditions. And uh, when you <coughs> looked at the bindles, on one of the fingernail scrapings in this case, there was some evidence that it was tacky even when it was collected. Is that correct? There was what appeared to be smearing on it that would indicate that it was still damp. Now, why is this distinction between damp and dry stains in a laboratory condition? Well, let me ask, ask it another way. Why is a distinction between damp stains at a crime scene as opposed to dry stains in a laboratory setting significant? Well, it's different conditions. But what, what's significant forensically about the different conditions in terms of degradation? Well, a damp condition, like I mentioned before, hastens uh, certain types of degradation. A dried sample, or even a damp sample for that case that's uh, subjected to heat is a different type of uh, environmental situation and potentially could create a, a different type of result.
Now, with respect to the Raxel and Eames artic article, did you, in interpreting that article, take this as a cautionary type statement with respect to the EAP marker? Oh, well. Sorry, don't you. Uh, did, did you take this as a, a statement to, an, to a forensic analyst to use caution with the EAP marker in terms of typing it? This meaning the whole article? Yes. Yeah, the, the crux of that and many of the other articles is just an indication that the EAP has a problem with degradation and uh, you need to be careful about how it's interpreted. And is that how you interpreted the article overall? Yes. Now, is it correct that with respect to these dried laboratory stains that they were talking about in Raxel and Eames, they did identify a particular degradation route? Yes, they did. And I'd, I'd like to uh, direct your attention back to our EAP board. So maybe we can While we're getting that, uh, maybe you can describe for us verbally what this degradation route was that was discussed both during cross-examination and also in Raxel. Okay, my understanding of it is uh, similar to what was discussed before, that under those conditions and identifying the samples the way they are, uh, you know, the process of identifying the types, the degradation route showed the progressive loss of the faster bands or the anodal bands so that you lose first a A2, B2, A1, and then eventually the B1. And uh, let, let's uh, take this step by step. You use the term anodal. What does that mean? That is a, an electrical term. It refers to the positive side uh, as opposed to the negative side, which is cathodal. Looking at our EAP phenotype board, the block diagram that we've used, uh, can you tell us which is the anodal side of the diagram? Looking at the diagram, the anodal side is where the plus is on the left, cathode is on the right where the negative is. Why don't we take off the uh, little magnetic strips? respect to the, the BA phenotype, can you describe for us the um, degradation route that was uh, discussed by Raxel and Eames with respect to dried laboratory stains that were staged? The degradation route, you know, like previously described on cross. Maybe you can use a pointer or something so that we can. All right, and we're referring to People's Exhibit 217? I believe so. May, uh, let me double check. Two seventeen. Yes. The degradation route, as was previously described, but using this chart now to show it, would mean that you'd have a loss of the A band, which is indicated above that's farthest to the left, then the B band, next one to the right of it, then the other A band, second band from the right, and then finally what has been marked as the C band. And that is the degradation route that was described in the Sraxel and Eames? Yes, under the conditions that they had those samples. Now, sir, in your experience as a uh, serologist, and also based upon your reading of the literature, is that the only degradation route? No, it is not. Okay, and generally speaking, and maybe this is a slight oversimplification, you're saying this particular degradation route would be from the positive side to the negative side of the um, block diagram that we have. The one I described earlier, yes. But it is not the only one. No.
Your Honor, I'm wondering if, if I might be able to use the defense exhibit on uh, their block diagram showing the, the EAP degradation route. Which item was that? We don't have it in our system. Mr. Harris, do you have that available? Do you know which number and letter you want? <clears throat> have we printed those out yet, Mr. Harris? Okay. While we're awaiting that, Mr. Goldberg, do you have any other matters you can take up? 1141A through Z. I think about L is what you're looking for, correct? That sounds like it might be about right. right. <coughs> do you have anything else you can talk to? Yes. Ask Mr. Matheson while we're waiting. Yes, uh, Mr. I Blaise, I appreciate your cooperation with that. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Too. Uh, now, Mr. Uh, Matheson, you were also talk, uh, asked about an uh, article by the name of, uh, by the authors of Zajac, Z A J A C, Grunbaum, G R U N B A U M, and Krim, C R I M. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, is this an article that came out after the one that we just discussed, the Raxel and Eames article? I believe so, yes. And is this the article that, that previously you testified uh, said that inherent characteristics of the EAP system give rise to the possibility of very serious errors in phenotyping and other than fresh blood, especially if the history of the sample is not fully known? Yes, it is. Now, in this particular uh, article on page 615, uh, Zajac. Yeah. Did they make reference to the Raxel and Eames article that you were asked about on cross-examination that we just discussed? Yes, I believe it does. And did they distinguish the Raxel and Eames article as dealing with a different situation from the situation that they were discussing in uh, their article? Yes. Can you read for us what they said in order to distinguish Raxel and Eames from their article? Yes, in referencing the Raxel and Eames article, they followed that up with stating, apparently the blood stains they used were prepared under laboratory conditions and the history and drying and preservation were well known. And in Grunbaum, were they trying to give an idea of what would happen to wet samples that were not prepared under laboratory conditions? Leading. Well, in the article, what did they say? Uh, what kind of stains were they? dealing with here. Okay, the uh, comment they made is that the preparation of their blood samples were done in such a way to simulate the adverse conditions which may take place in actual casework submitted to a crime lab. Now, <coughs> with respect to the, uh, their article, did they uh, identify the same degradation route that you just described that was discussed in the Raxel and Eames? I don't believe it was specifically uh, delineated there. Okay. Did they say that, that, how did they characterize, can you read for us how they characterized 
the problems of misidentification that occurred in this particular study with the samples that they created. It states the problem with misidentification of the samples in this study was not due to weak or indistinct band patterns. Rather, dis discrete bands were present and readable, but they had been altered to indicate erroneous phenotypes. Okay, and <clears throat> how did you interpret that? Well, again, that uh, this system has degradation problems and that multiple bands can be read still and misinterpreted. I mean, even if you have discrete band patterns such as 2B bands. I believe that indicates that. Now, Could I see 1141G, Mr. Harris? Is that possible? And then I want to see H and I. Okay, I want, I want to go back to the uh, Raxel and Eames um, <coughs> article and the uh, degradation route that they discussed. What does this represent when we're looking at the BA block diagram? It represents a general location of the bands of a type BA. All right, and the B block diagram? It also represents the general location of the bands of a type B, though in neither case does it give any sort of indication of the intensity differences. <clears throat> And then let's see, uh, let's see, this is H. Can we see uh, U? When you said that they don't give an indication of the intensity differences, you mean what? Well, that's one of the ways of determining the types is, to, particularly between a B and a C, is how intense certain bands are. And these are just all being blocked as approximately the same size as opposed to the people's chart on EAP, which does define the different <coughs> intensities by the different sizes of the bands. Okay, now, can you tell us what we're looking <coughs> at here in terms of the degradation route? This is consistent with the degradation route described in the Raxel article. And that is what? that you lose the bands from the anodal side or the plus side towards the cathodal side or the negative side, the slow side. Can you orient this uh, just verbally in relationship to the people's chart, the six EAP uh, diagrams on the block diagram, just to, to show us how the two would interrelate? If you, <coughs> excuse me, if you were to turn the chart that's being projected up be 90 degrees to the left so that the arrow would indicate the origin or the cathodic side. Okay. And can we see the next, it would be V on this, please? And now what does this show? See, it's the final step in the degradation route that's described in the Raxel article where what originally started out as a BA, the only thing that's left is the B1 band. Okay, but you're saying that this de degradation route that you were asked about is not the only one that you have seen or that is in the literature? That's correct. 1141, is this a V? V is in Victor. The previous one was 1141U. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Now, 
The, uh, another uh, one of the articles, the three articles that you were asked about, was the Yashan. Excuse me, let's ask, uh, let me ask you about the Sensaba article first. Did the Sensaba article contain a broad based study of the phenomena of EAP disintegration, or were they uh, looking at only one stain when they discussed this degradation route, the one that we just saw in the defense? It appears by reading that article that when they're referencing that degradation route that's been described in the Raxel article, that uh, just uh, two blood stains were used, one of a type B and one of a type BA. All right. And then finally, the Yashan article that was referenced. Did the Yashan article contain what purported to be a study of the phenomena of B, dis BA disintegration to B? No, it did not. What was that? It, it was a technical note uh, regarding the degradation of a B to a CB. I don't know if it then carried on to a C, but uh, the A allele was not mentioned. Okay, so Yashan was not actually studying, uh, did not purport to be studying the B A to B phenomena per se. That's correct. She was um, studying other issues in the uh, EAP marker system with respect to degradation. Oh, I don't know about studying. She was referencing other issues, yes. Now, with respect to all four of the articles we've mentioned so far, the Raxel and Eames, the Grunbaum and Zajac, the Sensaba and the Yashan article. Considered together, did you take those articles as some sort of a cautionary statement to the forensic analyst with respect to the EAP system? Yes, I did. How so? And that is, I mean, every one of them indicates that the EAP enzyme, unlike the other ones, does in fact degrade and that a degradation can lead to mistyping. So you have to be careful about how you interpret EAP results. Now, when you were asked about the Raxel and Eames, uh, well, let me ask you another question first. This book that you alluded to during your direct examination, what was the book? It's the Forensic Science Handbook by Richard Safferstein. And was there a particular uh, portion of that book that you referenced in particular informing the opinions that you expressed on the witness stand with respect to the BA to B phenomena? It enforced my knowledge of that, yes. Can you tell us which portion you looked at? It was a section that was written by Dr. Sensaba. Maybe you can give us the page number because I, I believe counsel may have a copy of that. Well, it's chapter 8 that starts on page 338, uh, the area that we are referencing. Uh, I believe the paragraph starts on 369 and concludes on 370. Yeah, that's a pleasure. Uh, if I may look. And did uh, Raxel, uh, did uh, Mr. Sensabaum in this uh, chapter that he authored mention the Raxel and Eames, or what we've discussed as being the Raxel and Eames degradation route? Yes, it does. Did he say that that was the only degradation route? I don't believe so, no. Can you tell <coughs> us what he said? <clears throat> Well, it makes reference to the stabilities of the isozymes that are the different types. Uh, one quote here is that the A isozymes are the least stable and the C isozymes the most stable. Thus, one might expect the A bands in BA and CA types to be lost before the B or C bands are lost, and this, in fact, has been observed. 
And does he say anything? The rest of that paragraph is read. Mr. Goldberg. I don't know what the legal basis of the objection is. Thank you. <coughs> 256. What? 256, I believe. Sir, can you read the rest of the paragraph? I'd be happy to. Sure. In typing aged type BA blood stains, for example, only the major B band, the anodal B band, may be apparent, and the temptation would be to type the sample as a B. To avoid error of this sort, empirical rules for typing interpretation need to be invoked. Since it has been observed that in aged BA blood stains, the slow B band is generally lost before the fast A band, the controlling rule is to withhold judgment on a putative B type until both beams, excuse me, both B bands are apparent. If the sample is in fact a BA type, the major A band should be apparent by that time. Now, did uh, Mr. Sensabum identify any particular degradation route that is different from the Raxel and Eames degradation route? I feel that this article, or this, excuse me, this paragraph actually mentions a couple of different uh, routes or dis discrepancies between the possible ways the degradation can occur. Objection moved to strike as non responsive. How so? What other degradation route is identified there, sir? Well, in one sentence, he states that in typing age type BA blood stains, for example, only the major B band or the anodal B band, this is the anodal or the one closest to the uh, anode side, as opposed to this band, which is a cathodal or closest to the uh, origin, may be apparent. He's saying that at some point, it's possible that only the major band or the brightest band might be present. And how is that different from the Raxel and Eames? In their study, they saw the degradation route so that the band, the cathodal band, was the last one that was apparent. Maybe we can just, let's just cover up the A bands for a moment so that we can uh, <coughs> make sure that I'm understanding. Yes. In the BA, on the BA chart for the record, I just put the covers back over the A bands on the BA phenotype. Okay, yes. so Rax, according to the Raxel and Eames study, they're saying that which band would remain after, after the sample had degraded? The most cathodal one, or the one closest to the origin. Okay, the one that's on the right side of this diagram. That's correct. And in uh, this portion that you just read to us in Sensabom, he's saying which? In that one portion there, he makes reference to what he calls the major B band, excuse me, or the cathodal B band, or excuse me, the anodal B band may be apparent. And does he say that these degradation routes, that it always occurs in either of these two ways? I didn't read that in there, no. Does he say that, uh, <coughs> that these are general ways that they happen, that this is how it generally happens? There is the term generally used. Yes. So in interpreting that, did you, as a forensic analyst, take that to mean that this is the only path, degradation path, that this marker will take, or that this is one of the degradation paths that this marker will take? Objection, please. Sustain, the question. How did you take that term that this generally, generally can take these two paths? On reading that paragraph and the discrepancies between the different types, it indicates to me that there may be more than one way that degradation can occur. And did you take the totality of the just referenced, and also the source book that I think you referenced earlier in your cross-examination, as providing some sort of cautionary statement to the forensic analyst when trying to type a B and distinguishing it from a BA. Yes. And what was that? Again, in general, that this is an enzyme that has degradation problems, and you just have to be careful about the interpretation of the results. Did anything that you read in these articles, Mr. Matheson, cause you to change the statement that you made initially on your analyzed evidence report that you could not exclude the possibility that with respect to the fingernail scrapings, it was a BA that degraded into a B? No, it did not. Did anything that was brought up during cross-examination 
by the defense cause you to uh, change the opinion that you've offered on direct that probably the samples underneath the fingernails were a BA that degraded to appear to be a B? I'm not sure about the term. Sustained. Okay. What was your opinion, your bottom line opinion, when you considered all of the facts of this case as you are aware of them? including the, 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 the photographs of where the victim's body was, the pool of blood, item, item number 42, and the other tests that you did. What was your opinion as to uh, the fingernail scrapings? Well, the result does not change. I did see a B, but in considering absolutely everything, I would have to say that it is a uh, likelihood that the blood that was found under the fingernails were in fact from Ms. Brown and had degraded, but again, I cannot totally eliminate the possibility that it's a B. Okay. Now, did anything that was brought up during cross-examination cause you to change that opinion or reevaluate that opinion? No, it did not. Now, sir, uh, with respect to um, resolving this issue, is it possible to look at a control study from the scene? I don't know if it totally resolves it, but it does lend credence to the possibility that you have degradation occurring. And what does that mean using a, a control study? If, if you are typing or if you test another blood sample that's of a known source or that you believe to be of a known source from the scene, and it shows a similar type of degradation that you have seen in the past and experienced and that that possibility exists in, in your sample, then I, I believe it's important to take that into consideration. Now, is this idea of looking at a control study, such as a pool of blood underneath the victim, something that was reflected in science, in the forensic science literature that you considered prior to your testimony here? Well, I had that opinion prior to this. However, I have read uh, an article that enforces my opinion about that. I had it right in my hand. Okay. Uh, specifically, sir, did you look at an article by Bruce Bredoli and Robert Allen entitled Electrophoresis Reliability, the Contaminant Issue? Yes, I did. And uh, <coughs> direct your attention to page 1546. Mr. Blazer, do you have that article? I do. We cited this in one of our papers, Your Honor. Uh, sir, is this dealing with the EAP issue per se, or is this dealing more broadly uh, with various contaminant issues in electrophoresis and res problem resolving in electrophoresis? It's dealing with electrophoresis reliability in general, not just with EAP. Can you tell us, can you read for us the portion of the Bredoli article that suggests looking at a control study from the scene and trying to provide more information about what's happening at the scene. The portion that I have bracketed off there. Starts with, furthermore, the competent and experienced forensic scientist does not work in a vacuum. It should be stressed that the analyst gathers as much information as possible regarding the case. Then in 
parentheses, and potential influence such as contaminants, close parentheses, to evaluate properly the data obtained from evidentiary material. More importantly, in reality, an ideal control study is naturally provided to forensic scientists. This is the electrophoretic analysis of victim's blood on victim's clothing and other substrata. The blood shed by a victim onto his or her own clothing and surrounding substrata is exposed to the same myriad of environmental insults as other questions stains submitted to the laboratory for electrophoretic analysis. The accuracy of electrophoretic typing of the question sample can be independently verified with the victim's whole blood. And sir, what was your interpretation of that in terms of using a control study to resolve issues as to what's happening in a crime scene? Well, that confirmed a policy that we have had as far as collecting a known blood sample from the scene from each of the victims and that information from that can be used to consider information derived from other samples. And sir, is that why in expressing certain opinions in court on direct examination regarding this EAP issue, you considered test results on the pool of blood underneath Nicole Brown, item 42? Yes, that's correct. Maybe we can see the uh, serology results for it. Now, Mr. Matheson, when you considered uh, those test results, on 42, were those test results inconclusive? Yes, they were. And were you reporting those test results? Let me re wait until we put the board up. Maybe it will make it a little easier. That's people's 202. Okay, directing your attention to the item that says 42, blood under Nicole Brown. Under the EAP column, it says inconclusive B, very weak. Is that correct? Yes, it does. And were you reporting this inconclusive result for the purposes of suggesting that it was correct? In other words, that the blood was, in fact, a type B blood? Well, I did not report a type at all for that. My report reflects inconclusive. I'm sorry, my terminology was, was wrong. When you were testifying about this result, were you testifying about it for the purposes of suggesting that the inconclusive B was, was a correct result in the sense that the blood really was a type B? No, I was not. So what was your purpose in considering this and testifying about this and giving your explanations about the EAP results under the fingernails? Okay, the inconclusive, like I mentioned, no activity would be you're not seeing anything on the gel. A result that's reported is a definitive result. It's what you are seeing occurring on that gel. A inconclusive falls somewhere in between. It's a pretty broad range. It could be just almost possible to call, but you're not quite sure there's something about it, or it could be something that's very vague, just kind of a blurry occurrence in there. In this case, I observed what I thought might be a B, it wasn't good enough to call. I am not going to say for a fact that it is a B, but it occurred in an area and on a sample that we are assuming to be from a particular person and thus of a particular type. We know her for a, a fact to be a type BA, and the fact that this is an inconclusive B shows that there's something going on with this blood and with the samples and that the results should be uh, interpreted carefully. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to mark two more exhibits, and they're similar to, uh, in fact, uh, just smaller versions of the ones that the defense marked. As people's next in order. 224. Can I mark them as 224A and 224? Yes. And A is what appears to be an electrophoretogram, and it has the numbers 1304. A. 
And Mr. Blazer, you're familiar with both of these? Uh, I am, but I have to bring them down. And uh, 20, 224B is 13, <coughs> excuse me, 7310. Now, to show those to Mr. Blazier real quick. When you were talking about item number 42 just a few moments ago, what was the purpose of, what is the purpose of collecting that, that item again? I think we've asked this a couple of times. Okay. So, sir, when you were saying that you were assuming that that is the victim's blood, that's based on what? The location from where it was collected. Okay. And is, is that why this type of sample is collected? Yes. Sir, I'd now like to show you people's uh, 224A and 224B. What is that? 224A is a copy of a photograph of my electrophoresis run number 7309, which contains, among other items, uh, the fingernail scrapings 84A and 84B. Okay, and 224B is? 224B is another photograph of a photograph of electrophoresis run number 7310, which includes, among other things, the results of item number 42. Now, on uh, 224B for identification, it's, I, I'd like to uh, perhaps, if we, I could put it on the Elmo and then maybe pass it around. But I'd like the witness to write something. Could you uh, identify for us, just by writing on the bottom of the photograph, where 42 is? It's in position four, and I'm putting an arrow up from the bottom above the number 42. We see the part of the photograph that has the writing on it. No, we need to see the, the white part, the bottom. Okay, so have you written in, in uh, where 42 is? Yes, I have. And is, is one of the reasons that you considered this that logically a pool of the victim's blood should contain the victim's blood? Yes. So without testing it, would have you expected this to look like a BA? Yes, I would have. But when you tested it, what did it look like? It gave a weak result that eventually ended up being called inconclusive, but I saw the two B bands very, very lightly kind of fuzzy clouds in the areas where you'd expect to see them. And maybe we can just, with directing the arrows, uh, print out where those are. Oh, I'm, 
Okay, we need to go up. I uh, move the arrow to the left. Now to the right. You can go lay right on top of that other band. And that's pointing right into the lower B band. That's that's fine right there. Okay, and let's put another arrow on the upper, pointing to the upper B band. If you go directly above the arrow that was previously placed by two bands, go up, 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 down a little bit. Right about in there is the other B band. I know it's hard <coughs> to see on the Elmo, Mr. Uh, Matheson, but uh, when you look at this plate, do you see any distinct band pattern in either of the two A regions? For that item? Yes. No, I do not. But do you see a band pattern in the 2B regions? I see something that has kind of a band-like appearance. It's not a good band. If it was, I'd have called it. All right. Now, assuming this is, in fact, a BA, using the Raxel and Eames degradation route, if we assume that were the only degradation route, would you expect to see this? No, I would not. Why not? Because if this is a fact, a BA, as you're assuming, then I would expect to s still see that lower A band in addition to the two B bands. I'm going to object. This mischaracterizes this exhibit. I see a band there. Oh, we'll Now, Mr. Matheson, if, but by the way, how many years do you have of experience uh, in total looking at these ba banding patterns? Approximately 12 years. Okay. And you're saying that there are only two distinct, I'm sorry, they didn't say they were distinct, but there are only two band-like patterns that you see on this. Objection, mischaracterized his testimony. He said it was not a band. Sustain, rephrase the question. There were only two patterns that you saw, is that correct? In that lane, I am seeing what appears to be two very weak band-like appearances in those areas. This is a very weak sample, difficult to read. Now, <clears throat> uh, can, we, have we printed, can we print this out? As people's 224 I show them to uh, Mr. Um, Matheson so that, the, uh, so that we know what we're looking for. You wrote a 42 on the lane that represents 42. Is that correct? Yes, I did. Pointing up. And the, uh, well, maybe I, we can also sh pass around the printout too so that they can just compare. May I see that, please? Sure. I have no objection to the photograph. Well, I just think the printout might be helpful in uh, identifying where to look. I disagree that, no, I disagree. All right, the objection's overruled. I might be able to ask a couple uh, questions. Please. Please do. Just to, yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to finish with Mr. Matheson today, if we could. Your Honor, I'd like to mark as people's next in order. Uh, 
225, and I may also be marking the 224D later on, but as 225, a document that says electrophoresis worksheet. And Mr. Blaise, you have a copy of this? contains 41, 42, it's, it's L387. All right. Mr. Madison, while we're, looking, while we're waiting for the uh, printout, can you just tell us what L387 is? L387 is a photocopy that actually is slightly crooked, cuts off part of the left hand column of one of my electrophoresis worksheets <coughs> for that corresponds with photo number 30, 7310. And on this particular worksheet, uh, you called item number 84, the fingernails, as a B what? This worksheet does not have 84 on it. Uh, that doesn't have 84. Does that have 42 on it? Yes, it does. I'm sorry. And what was 42 called as? A B question mark INC for inconclusive. <clears throat> the second reading on that was an NA for no activity. I just want to uh, perhaps put this on the Elmo just one more time, if I may, before I give it to the jury. This is 224B. I'm not going to mark it or make another printout. We have to see it again? I, I just want to make sure that everyone knows where to mark I, I think the arrow there is apparent in the lane. Okay. Now, sir, between the, uh, in, in the arrow, the arrow is pointing to an area that I guess on the photograph would be about a quarter to a half of an inch above it that's sort of a bright band. And where is the band that we're looking for in relationship to that? Well, it's in that same... Mischaracterizes the testimony. Sustained. What? Band. Well, I'm, I'm referring to the... You see these, these very, very bright hash marks that go all the way across the... Uh, bottom part of the photograph. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I do. Okay. And uh, there's one of those hash marks. There's an arrow uh, that has number 42, that's and the arrow's pointing to one of the hash marks. Yes. Okay. Where in relationship to that hash mark is the lane that constitutes 42? 42 is everything abo directly above the arrow. It's a lane about uh, 3 eighths of an inch wide directly above the arrow. I'm sure hash marks probably wasn't the scientifically correct term, but um,
Mrs. Robertson. That from Deputy Long, please. All right, proceed. Now, Mr. Matheson, I want to show you 224A for identification. And does that, do you still have that? Does that have um, item number 42, excuse me, item number 84 in it? Yes, I, yes, it does. And using the same pen, can you uh, write arrows for 84A and 84B? Okay, I'm writing an arrow, two arrows, down from the two columns that indicate 84A and 84B, and then marking 84A under one of the arrows and just B under the other one because of lack of space. Sir, on that, is the, are there any other results that you got that uh, appear to contain a B-like pattern? There are actually a couple others that I called B inconclusive, and I believe there is one. No, that's it. Is there a 117 on there? One of the lanes is the results of item 117. Can yes. you just point that out for us with the arrow, in other words, and write 117? Okay, I'm writing again an arrow pointing up into the lane that expresses the results or the data obtained from item number 117. And was 117 identified as being one of the rear gate stains from the Bundy location? Yes, I believe it was. And you got a B like pattern on that? I called it a B question mark inconclusive, yes. Now, Mr. Matheson, why do the lanes that contain 84A and B look so messy to a layperson? Well, there are times in electrophoresis where when you're doing a run, there is something that blocks or hinders the electrical flow through it. 
uh, through the gel from one side to another and causes the bands not to migrate as evenly as they should. Now, with respect to 84 A and B, is there, are there any haze, hazy areas on this that do not, in your opinion, constitute a distinct band pattern? Well, there's general haziness in a lot of the areas. Uh, and maybe using the, the marker, you can identify some of the haziness for us that, in your opinion, does not constitute a distinct band pattern. In other words, an A-like band. Well, in general, there is a haziness that shows up. We talk, we're talking about 84 A and B, a and B yeah. right now. That does show up or appear to exist between the two B bands. It's a general fluorescence or luminescence occurring there. Of, of which one, of, of 84 A or 84 B? Well, as I see it here, both of them. There just appears to be a general lightening of that area. Okay, can you direct the arrow down to the location that you're referring to? Okay, if you move the arrow to the left, farther, and down, 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 right in there. In general, that's true on both items. And you mean on the 84B one as well? That's correct. Can you uh, direct the arrow to the area on the 84B side? Can, can you get the arrow to face there? Thank you. Go. Foundation that this has any scientific meaning? Oh, we'll move the arrow to the right and down a little bit. Uh, and in that general area there, you can just see there's a slight brightening of that area, not a, a band, but uh, a, uh, something's occurring in that area. But in your view, does that have any forensic significance? Well, it's, it's not anything that I'd call even close to a band, so it's, no. Okay, and is that why? Uh, it does. It is helpful to have some experience in looking at these kinds of things, as opposed to just being a lay person to try to distinguish between something that's there but doesn't have any significance and something that's there and does. Objection, leading, sustain. Sir, does your experience as a serologist help you to distinguish between uh, something that appears that does not have significance? when looking at a EAP as opposed to something that does? Yes, it does. And how so? Well, it's just after having seen many of these samples, uh, you get the experience on how to read them. And in your opinion, these highlighted areas, uh, are not highlighted, but the areas with the arrows pointing to them, you would not conclude are A bands. Is that correct? I don't see what I feel are bands in that area. All right. Now, directing your attention to 117, how many bands on 84A do you see? We're talking about 84A now, right? 84A. I see what appears to be two bands. Can we use a different color arrow to, to uh, <coughs> demarcate those two bands? Okay, move, move it down, please. That's one of the bands there. It's kind of curved, but that's the band. Down further. Down, down, down. Right about there is, is roughly the middle left side of that band as it curves down. And can you uh, now mark for us using also green arrows, uh, but facing the other way, the bands that you see on 84B? Move it down. Over to the left a little bit, there, a little bit further, right there. That's that's the uh, one of the bands, and down further, down down. Go to the left, and right down inside of that mush is another. I move it up just a little bit, there. Uh, that's <coughs> the location of the other band. Okay, now, now let's uh, turn our attention to 117. If we can just keep this all and then print it out later to get it all in one shot. Uh, just for the record, Mr. Matheson, there are uh, two yellow arrows. Do those yellow arrows signify what you are saying are the uh, B bands in the 84A lane? Yes. And the red arrow signifies some haze that you consider to be insignificant? That I don't consider to be a band, that's correct. 
with respect to the 84B lane, the green arrows <coughs> signify the B bands in that lane? Yes. And the blue arrow signifies what? The hazy area in between it. That you do not attribute forensic significance to? That I'm not seeing a band, that's correct. Now, turning our attention to 117. Turning your attention to 117, does that also had a, a B-like uh, pattern according to your testimony? Is that correct? Well, I called it a B inconclusive. Right. Both bands are present. Objection outside the scope of direct on 117. Never mentioned. Sustained. Okay. Mr. Matheson, in your experience in other cases, have you seen instances where a known BA sample had degraded in such a way as to appear to be a B with both B bands present. I believe I have, yes. And have you seen situations like that occurring, in your opinion, at this particular crime scene? Yes, I believe I have. Only in uh, the pool of blood 42? Or, or elsewhere at the crime scene? Taking into account other information elsewhere. And is 117 one of the other locations where you believe that you've seen a B-like pattern? Objection beyond scope. Sustained. Well, sir, in, you, in your opinion, is your opinion uh, as to the fingernail scrapings that you've offered both on direct and cross take into account anything else at the crime scene? other than the items that you testified to specifically on direct and cross-examination? Objection beyond the scope. Well, you can answer that question. There is one other sample that I did take into consideration, not necessarily to make the call of the B, but to reinforce my feeling that uh, it may have at once time been a BA and that this phenomenon does in fact exist. And which one was that? Item number 117. Okay, now with respect to... Go, move to Sustain. strike. We're not going to go into 117. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. Let's move. Can we print out a copy of this uh, document? Objection beyond the scope. I object anything with 117 on it. Oh, well. <clears throat> Jury is, instruct, jury is instructed on this exhibit to just disregard the 117 lane, but rather than go back and remark the whole thing, let's print it out. All right, let's proceed. Thank you. In fact, we can slice that part off. Uh, maybe I can proceed with a few more questions and wrap up the EAP issue, and then I'd like to show these, fo the photograph and the printout to the jury. The photo I'd like to mark is 224, I mean the printout is 224D. I would request that the printout be cut off on the end rather than scribbled on. We'll do that. And uh, with respect to item 85, I'm not going to, we won't show the, the electrophoresis grant, uh, plate on that. I'm not sure that it's worth the time. But uh, on 85 A and B, on our board, you said that the EAP type was inconclusive BA. That's how it's on the board, yes. And with respect to the B band, excuse me, A bands on that sample, what did you see? That they were weaker than I would expect for a uh, expected BA result. 
And was what you were seeing consistent with the Raxel and Eames article in terms of the degradation path for the laboratory stains in that article? Objection beyond the scope of direct. Oh, well. What I was seeing, assuming that was degradation, did not appear to be consistent with that route. Why? Because the two B bands were quite bright and the two A bands were fairly weak. Now, Mr. Matheson, with respect to this issue of EAP, what steps did you take in order to try to resolve it further after this testing was performed? I recommended that those items be submitted for DNA testing. Okay. And it was suggested that when these came back from the Department of Justice, it was for the purposes of EAP testing. Is that true? That's something that was mentioned on CROSS, yes. But I mean, is it true that, that, that that's the purpose for which they were returned to your laboratory? No. Like I testified, they were just returning to become a part of the rest of the case. It's our evidence. What was everything from DOJ that was sent to them eventually returned to your laboratory? Uh, most everything. At this point, I'm not sure if we have absolutely everything back in our okay. laboratory. And why not do another EAP test? At this point, I didn't feel it was necessary. Well, wh why would you decide to submit it for DNA testing but not perform another EAP test? Well, initially, I didn't want to uh, use up any more sample to run additional tests. And would an additional EAP test provide you with more information? I would expect it to give me the same result as it did the first time. Would a genetic test, well, why would you expect it to give you the same result as it did the first time? Because the result is what I obtained from the sample. If I run it once or a hundred times, I would expect to see the same thing from that sample. So it doesn't get undegraded just because you rent, uh, run it another time? Assuming it was degraded, yes, it would, would not just go undegraded. Is there a way, by the way, uh, according to the scientific literature, to undegrade a sample, to bring out a degraded band? Depends on what we're calling degraded. There are some situations where you get a type of de degradation, you add a, what's a uh, reducing agent to it, and it can correct some of the problems. Okay, well, is, or is there anything that could be d done in this? I don't know if this is a correct term to undegrade bands, if there are A bands in our uh, samples here, 84 A and B. Not to my knowledge, no. Uh, and you've testified that generally speaking, when you're doing these tests, you try to conserve sample for future testing. Is that correct? All types of tests, yes. And is that so that it will be available for anyone, either the defense or prosecution, that wants to do more testing on an item? Yes, you try and not use any more sample than necessary. Did you want to conserve any remaining sample from 85A and 85B rather than using it on another EAP Isn't test? Isn't this sort of like the, the same question about turned about the fifth way around? I don't know. I think so. Okay, the, thank jury, you. the jury loved the undegraded question. Hand those two items to juror number one, please.
We'll take a break at 2.30. Council without the court report. 